Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Alright, let's get started. Um, about the desk us today, and then we'll finish up talking about uh, the proposal presentations coming on this week on Wednesday. Okay, so let's hold off any questions un until then. All right, so today we're going to pick off where we left last class, talking about what what data files actually look like, what actual data looks like. Um, and so recall from last class, we talked about sort of what, what these different storage models you'd have: NSM or row storage, DSM column, like pure column store. And then, as I said, everything is pretty much packs these days. You're going to divide your your table up into horizontal partitions to row groups, and then within each within each row group, you're going to lay all the bits or bytes for each column contiguously before jumping to the next column. So you get the best of both worlds. You, you get the column store, uh, uh, contiguous values, uh, but also the spatial locality of, of a row store. We then talk about, all right, for the different uh, file formats, what's actually inside of them, what additional things we're, we're going we're gonna, we're gonna to record uh, not beyond just you know, the data itself. So we talk about the metadata, um, keeping track of what's in the, what was in the footer, where, where they jump to offsets in the row groups. The format layout specifying, again, like is it uh, row store or column store? What is the actual um, the nesting structure within that? The type system, we sort of glossed over quickly to say there's some primitive types, logical types. Encoding schemes, we spend a lot of time uh, on, and we'll talk about mostly today, different ways to encode the data. Uh, naive block compression or general purpose compression is taking whatever you, you produce from the, in your file from the, the lightweight encoding or the, the uh, you know, these schemes here, and then just throw Snappy or Z-Standard or Gzip at it. Actually, never use Gzip. Snappy or Z-Standard. Uh, zone map bloom filters, and then we rush through the, the shredding stuff. Um, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time in the beginning today going over that more detail, because again, I think this, this is a neat idea from the BigQuery general stuff, and we'll see this again later in, in the semester. And then we'll kick off uh, the conversation about uh, today's paper. So again, real-world data sets. There's a lot, of, uh, a lot of JSON out there, and if you're at Google, a lot of protocol buffers. Um, and if we just store the, the, a JSON document as a varchar, as a text or blob inside of a column, you know, yeah, we can run JSON functions on them to extract out the structure from it, but that's not gonna, we're going to lose all the advantages of having a column store with PAX layout and be able to do vectorized execution. So instead, what we want to do is, is split up or blow up the JSON document for every single tuple and store the paths within that document as separate columns. So, you know, the NoSQL guys talk about, oh, this is, this, these are schemaless databases, you can define your schema later. Um, and that just means that you don't have to call create table and specify here's exactly the columns I have for different types, you just throw JSON at it. But inherently there's always a schema, right, because it doesn't make sense to have like random applications writing random documents into a table, because then nobody can make, it, make sense of it. So the, the the documents you may be putting in may not have all the same fields, but at least there'll be enough overlap in the structure that we can break things up and then store it as columns. So again, I'm going to focus on, the, on uh, go through a walkthrough of the, the record shredding from Dremel, and then we can briefly talk about length and presence uh, encoding. All right, so the basic idea of shredding is that we're going to store paths in our, uh, in our columns, or sorry, store, for each path, we're going to store it as a separate column, and then we're going to record how many steps deep we are into a given document for that, uh, for that hierarchy. And unlike in length and presence, we'll see in the next slide, if something doesn't necessarily exist, doesn't mean we need to always record that it's actually there. Where in length and presence, you, you do. So there's going to be two additional columns we're going to find. Um, I think of these are just going to be integer columns that we can then do all the encoding impression stuff we talked about before. Right? So, Adding additional columns, yes, that's more data we're storing per attribute uh, within our, our JSON document. But like again, we can compress these things pretty well and, and avoid a lot of the, you know, the bloat of the, of the storage space. So the first one is going to be the definition level, and that's going to determine how many. Uh, it's going to keep track of how many optical elements uh, existed to get us to the current path we are in our in our hierarchy. And the repetition level is going to say if it's a repeated structure. Like in our schema up here, we have two repeated structures. We have the, the repeated group name and the repeated group language. So how many times have we seen those, those repeated groups at that given level repeat? So let's walk through the example of this, this simple document here. Again, this, this is what, roughly what protocol buffer looks like. 
or think of like a, you know, defining a schema on, on, on a JSON document or XML. All right, so we're going to walk through this document here and we're going to scan through as if we were loading it into our, our database system and show how it's going to generate the, the attributes across the different columns uh, in our shredded model. So at the very beginning, it's easy, right? We have a document ID. So we have a, a table that corresponds to the document ID path, right? That's at the root or the top of the, the document. So then we just insert a new record there. But at this point here, there's no repeats before us, so the re repetition value is zero, and there's nothing, uh, there's, there's, no other, um, there's no other things in the path before us, so the definition is, is zero. But then now as we scan down, we hit the first nested structure. We have name, and within inside that, we have a repeated group called language. So now we see our first entry for the code here. So we're going to create a new, new column for our shredded document, where we have the value that's being stored, the repetition value is set to zero because we're the first, uh, the first language object or group that we've seen at this level in the hierarchy. And then we set the definition uh, to two because we're two, two levels deep. Then we go down to the country, and now we see that uh, we can create a new column. The value is US. That's easy. Repetition is zero because there's nothing before us. And then now we're, we're sort of three elements into our, our path. Then we go to the next group for language, all right? And so again, we see a code. We insert that here. We're the, th we're the second, or again, starting at zero, it's the second uh, repeated group within this uh, hierarchy. So we set that to one. And then our path to get here is, is two, just like it was here, right? Because we had to go from name to language to, to code. And then now we don't have a country. So in this case here, because we at least have something at the at the group level within the language, uh, we have to put an entry here, right? Again, the same as before, we're one into the uh, repetition, and then we have two elements to the path to get us here. But again, because there's no value here, we set it to two. Then we go down to the URL here, URL here and again, repetition is zero because we're the first, uh, first name in our, in our group, just like we were in document. But then our def is two because it went from name and then to, to URL, right, just as, as we were over here. Then we jump down to this group. This is just name with nothing else. So we put, sorry, it's just, it's just a name with a URL and no other attributes for the, the language. So I, oops, sorry. So we, we add our entry into here, right? Repetition one, because we're the second element in the repeated group, and the path is two to get us, get us there. But then now we got to put placeholders here to say that uh, there wasn't anything within the uh, repeated group for language, right? So repeated group one, because we're the one, this is the, the second group within the, that level of the name. And then the definition is one to say the path is really one to get there, right? It's the same as the path as, um, actually, why is that two? Yeah, because it's, it's one down from name. So if you want to know how deep you actually are, as you follow along from this, you could then get that and see that you're actually three levels deep. Yes? Yeah. His question is, why is code, uh, go back here, why is the, the line, the error doesn't line up, PowerPoint was being stupid. So in this case here, I add English US, the definition for the path is two, but then when I add the country, the definition of passion is three, because as he said, the, the code is required, the country is optional. Other questions, sorry. Yes? Then why is the, like, null, when we add, like, for the second definition of, like, the language group, we add null, and that def is different, then, if, if it's, like, in the same place as the country? This question is, why, is, is this example here, why is the definition two, uh, if it's taking place, same place as the country? Um, uh, because it doesn't exist, I think that's why. Right, that you're not you're not moving down even farther. Yes. So like how many pointer traversals you have to go through? The question is, is, is it determined in the pointer traversals that you have to go to? Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the definition is like how many steps are you down within the path to get to where you're at, you're at? And so if it's not there, it doesn't doesn't count. It's my understanding of it. Yes. So 
his question is, is there any advantage of doing this, storing the, the structure as columns versus storing pointers? But what are these pointers? Sorry. I guess records, like some, some way to get the other information. I guess this is I guess this is similar, but like it's it's representing a list as just. The I, so the I, the idea is that think of it. You had a query. The reason why we're storing this structure here is that we want to be able to go through the column itself without having to go back to figure out how we actually got there when we do a select query. So so I don't have a select query here, but think of like select star from table where. Uh, name.language.code equals U, uh, enus. So I can just rip through this column here. I don't need to refer to any uh, any other ones. And when I find any matches, I can then use that to figure out where do I need to go jump back in the offsets if I want to stitch things back together. So is there any overhead in like, trying to reconstruct this document from like, joining all these tables back together? Um, say, 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 it again. Say, sorry, say it again. Is it what, sorry? So the question is, what, is, is there a large overhead of uh, if I have to then reverse this shredding, yeah. taping it back together to go back to the original form? Absolutely, yes. But the advantage is that, is that when, we, when we want to do lookups, it's already broken up in a form that we can find things very quickly. So if you know that you're, you're going to be looking up these very specific things, why don't you just like, break it up into columns in the first place? Like, like completely create a good semi-structure that's what they're uh -huh. giving you. Yeah, this is what they're giving us. Some asshole developer says, I'm going to give you JSON, and we've got to handle that. Right? Yeah. We haven't even talked about how we're going to handle the type either. Yeah. Right? Like, and we'll see this in Snowflake. Snowflake will actually try to figure out, oh, I see these bunch of strings. Let me, I'll, just, I'll keep the original JSON, but also make a, I'll synthesize a, a string column for you, a varchar, or whatever the type is. So does SQL know about JSON, or is this something just at the execution level? This question is, does SQL know about JSON? I mean, the SQL standard has JSON. Uh, yeah, it has JSON constructs or data types. But, it, like, but again, that's the SQL is at the logical level. So SQL is the programmer sees. Underneath the covers, right, we, the database system is free to store data any way that it wants. And Dremel made the decision to do it this way because they want to optimize for the common case of just doing lookups through, down paths, right? Extreme example is everything's, JSON, everything's a blob. Um, and then I have to parse it every single time I run a query. This avoids all that. You're basically materializing as if you parsed it ahead of time. Okay. So in the sake of time, I don't want to spend too much on this, but like, you, you kind of get the better general idea that we're breaking this up, we're generating columns, uh, and we can use that to figure out the, the path as, as, you know, as, we, as we scan through. Um, can you explain the uh, ENGB ones? I was just moving around. This question is the, the, the Great Britain one. So, we're now here, right? So we now have a new name, right? There's, uh, we have, let's see, the name is, is, is repeated group, and then with repeated group we have the, the country. Now we have Great Britain here. Our repetition is one, which that might be wrong. Yeah, that's actually, this is yeah. why I asked it. The yeah, this is from the Dremel paper. I had to fix some of these things, yeah. I think there's. This is not the, so the, the, the values are incorrect according to the Dremel paper. Different values. So the second row, the en one two, would yeah. be two two, because it, the repetition level isn't defined as the, the how many times the structure has been repeated, but the level to which the like, structure has been repeated, like name dot language has been repeated. Uh -huh. So it's two. Got it. Okay. <coughs> yep. All right. We'll fix that later. All right. So yeah, the, the the typo here is that it's the it's the number of times that the, it's been the group's been repeated. The length, yeah. the length, the length at that level. Uh, yeah. yeah. Again, low level details not. The low level details uh, maybe not entirely matter. It's the idea of like taking JSON, taking something and breaking it up, because we can do this at the physical level, and that'll make queries run faster later on. And the application programmer doesn't know, doesn't care. All right, again, in the sake of time, I'm going to skip past um, length and presence. Basically, the idea is that you're just storing. Um, uh, you can always walk down as if you know, for each sort of level, 
you're just going to record whether something is, exists or not. Right? Uh, the, the Dremel paper really later on, there's specific experiments they show that the, the, the shredding one is, is better. Okay, so let's get back now talking about the, the, where we left off. Last class, talking the big picture of these, these parquet and orc, showing how uh, they have different levels of sophistication and complexity in, the, in their implementations of how they encode things. Um, but the, these file formats are really designed from a different hardware era. Like 10 years ago, or you know, 12 years ago now, Parquet's in Orca 2011, 2012. Um, back then, the, the network was seen that was the, always the slowest thing. And then disk was slow. And then memory and everything and the CPU stuff, all that's fast. So you, you, they were making a trade-off to, to use heavyweight compression schemes like D standard, like uh, Snappy, because that would reduce the, 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 the size of the blocks they were fetching for data files. But now the hardware has shifted such that like network is actually really, really fast. Right? And you can get on Amazon, I think, 100 gigabyte uh, Ethernet connections for instances, and it's not that much. Um, so the trade-offs and design decisions that the Parquet and Orc people made, you know, they're not wrong in, in, like, like, as if they were doing something stupid. It's just the, the hardware landscape has shifted so much that you need to revisit what, what they were doing. So there's a couple other problems in these formats uh, that are going to be a problem for us when we want to start doing, uh, you know, start vectorizing the operations on our, um, you know, inside of our engine. So the first is that Parquet and Orc are going to generate variable size runs, right? Like, they, like they're going to, uh, they're making decisions on how to encode different things at different parts within a column chunk. And that means as you're scanning along, trying to decode it to find data you're looking for, you have to have these conditionals to figure out, is my data this way or that way? And then sometimes it might be a certain size versus another size, right? Well, that's bad for SIMD. Does everyone know what SIMD is? Is everyone taking 418, 618? Because who here doesn't know SIMD? Okay. It's in the paper. Okay. Uh, well, let me give you a quick crash course. Everything you need for this. Everything you need to know. All right. Single instruction, multiple data. So it's these class of, of CPU instructions that you can get on modern processors that allow you to do multiple things, sorry, do the same operation on multiple pieces of data at the same time. Contrast this with, with SysD in Flynn's taxonomy, single instruction, single piece of data. Like, you know, X equals one. That's a single instruction and take the value one, put it into a register over X, right? So the, say when I start doing things like uh, matrix, matrix addition, right? X plus Y equals Z. So the way you would typically write this using SysD instructions, you would have a little for loop where you just iterate over all the elements of I, or sorry, elements of X, assuming that X and Y are the same, same length. And then I'm just going to add them again and, and sort in Z. Right? So with SysD, again, you're just literally running through the for loop. And in each loop, you're, you're adding one by one. Yeah, you can unroll it. That'll speed things up, whatever. But it's still, at the end of the day, it's, do, it's doing uh, single instruction per each uh, level within our, our vectors. So the idea with SIMD is that I can break out the, 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 the pieces of data I'm trying to operate on into chunks, lanes, that I can store in these SIMD registers. So in this case here, really simple. Say I'm storing 32-bit integers, and then I have, uh, I'm putting four, four values in a single register, so I have 120-bit registers. Right? The current, uh, the largest register you can get now is 512. The, the fast lanes paper talks about a, a hypothetical 1024. SIMD register, that doesn't exist. 512 is the state of the art, and we'll cover that more later on. So now what I can do is uh, within a single instruction, I can just, the, the CPU will take this register and that register, add them up, and then write it out to another register. And now that's one instruction. Do the same thing for the next, the next block or the next portion of the data. Again, another SIMD, uh, SIMD instruction to go add it up. So what, what, went, what was uh, before this, assuming you're just counting the number of addition instructions, eight instructions to add the X and Y together, I can now do this in two. I'm ignoring the cost of getting things into the register and out of the register, and we'll see problems with AVX 512 where they're actually, the CPU will slow itself down when you start using AVX 512 in some cases, right? So it's not magically, magically free. There is some work to actually do this, but that's the general idea of what SIMD is. And we'll see more about this uh, next week and then a few lectures after that as well. Okay, so. But, as I said, these, these registers are always going to be like 128-bit, 256, uh, 
512, and then it's going to have uh, every element within, within that I'm storing in a lane has to be the same size. So I have variable length encoding. I got to put everything now to the same length, or s the same size, before I can load it into the register, and, that, and that, that's expensive. The other problem with the, these uh, formats is that, um, as I said before, they, they want to eagerly decompress everything. So they, they don't expose to you the dictionary into the execution engine of your database system to allow you to start doing lookups on the dictionary itself. When you iterate over a column chunk in Parquet and Oracle, they give you back the decompressed values. Likewise, if you're using block compression, like a naive scheme, like Z standard or, or, G, or Snappy, you can't see anything, or the data system can't see anything inside of that compressed data because it's opaque to the database system. Because Z standard and Snappy, they have their own encoding scheme, and we can't actually interpret any, any, any values within the, um, with, you know, within, the, within the compressed data. The other problem is going to be in some encoding schemes, like specifically delta encoding and run length encoding, that there will be a dependencies between the adjacent values in our column chunk. And that means also we can't use SIMD because there's no way to pass data from sort of one element to another element if they're in the same register. Right? Delta encoding is just taking the difference between your, your neighbor, the pre preceding value in, in, a, in a column. So if you load that up in a SIMD register, you can't do that delta addition uh, very easily. And the last one is going to be uh, which is not really that big of an issue for us at this point in the semester, but the, the portability of the implementation because all, there's, there's a lot more hardware out there, a lot more s vendors between ARM and uh, RISC-V and, and GPUs, TPUs, and, and Xeons that if we, even actually within just Neon or ARM and uh, Xeons themselves, there's all these different versions of the ISA that all have different features of, of Cindy uh, SIMD capabilities, and there's no guarantee that if you write low-level intrinsic code, like the low-level instructions to do SIMD, that on, you know, one system is, is always going to work on another system. So ideally, you want to rely on the compiler to figure out how to vectorize this stuff for us. But Parquet and Oracle, because of the certain design decisions they made, they can't do that. Yes? Yeah, his question is, are there libraries like libsimd? Yes. Uh, are there libraries out there that can abstract away the low-level details of certain operations, and therefore, uh, if, you, if you write your code against that library, the, then wh whatever ISA you land on, whatever hardware you land on, they can do it for you. Um, yes, but I'm not aware of anybody actually using those, at least in databases. Uh, again, we have friends on the inside. I ask them whether uh, they're using intrinsics or some kind of abstraction layer. Everybody's running with intrinsics. I don't know what DuckDB does, though. Like, they are trying to be port very portable. So we could look to see what they do. Um, yes? Why are dependencies between adjacent values bad? I don't understand that. So his question is, why are dependencies between adjacent values bad? Because think of, like, if I have, um, so it's actually, go back to my SIMD example here. If I go back here, right? Say that these are just raw encoding, uncompressed, but say it was delta encoding, right? And so start, starting, at, starting at the top, right, it's 8, and then the next one is 15, right? Because or, or, it's 8 plus 7 or something, right? Um, so if I, I can't load that in my register and have it do arithmetic right next to it, the thing that's next to it, you, can, you have to copy into another register and start sh you know, shifting things around. Yes, yeah, okay. we're setting, we're getting there. Yeah, no, no, no. Yes, uh, you made a bad movie writer because like you basically give the, give the, the, the end, you know, <laughs> right? It's like you're telling the ending of the story at the beginning. Uh, you have to set the mood. <laughs> okay. Yes, the answer is fast lanes did solve this particular problem. All right. So I'm going to talk about three different schemes today, um, and. Uh, the better blocks and the fast lanes ones, these are brand new. These papers just came out in the last year. Bit weaving is an old idea from Jignesh uh, Patel, the other data professor here that came out almost 10 years ago. But I still think these, it's, it's worth looking at because it's, it's a completely different way of thinking about how to store data. So I want to cover that a bit. Um, but the way to think about it is better blocks is going to be like 
Parquet plus plus, right? It's still going to be in the the sort of the same overall flavor of Parquet, just with better uh, lightweight encoding seams. And they'll, they'll do nesting in a in a with a sort of you know, recursive algorithm that tries to figure out the best ne nesting scheme automatically. Fast lanes is the paper I, I got. Had you guys read again? It's just a different way of thinking about how actually how to store data in a way that people really haven't considered that much. Like people have been sorting data all the time. Uh, that's a known, known trick, but like to purposely go out of your way to store it in a sort of almost arbitrarily random order because that's the best way to then decode it at runtime. Um, again, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a far, it's, it's not a common way to think about how to build database systems. And again, the main takeaway from all of this is gonna be the SQL layer, this is the, the application programmer, doesn't know what we're doing underneath the covers, right? They'll get all the benefit, things will be faster and cheaper uh, and more efficient, but they don't have to rewrite anything in their application code. Right, because SQL is just going to run uh, just fine. The database system will handle all that for them. All right, so we'll go through each of these one by one. All right, so Better Blocks is a pack based file format out of uh, TU Munich. Um, we're going to read a lot of papers from, from the guys at Munich. Uh, they have a sister system called Hyper and a new one called Umbra. Um, they have very good database professors there, probably some of the best people in the world. Um, so this paper came out, came out of their group last year. And so the idea with better blocks is that it's going to do more aggressive nested encoding schemes than with Parquet and ORC. Right? Parquet only did dictionary encoding for, uh, for strings, um, but it didn't try to do any additional optimizations for like, the, the, the codes that came out of them. Um, ORC tried to be more sophisticated and have, at least for integer columns, try to figure out, you know, should I compress it this way versus that way? But it was basically static heuristics. And so when better blocks, what they're going to do is they have a more or less a greedy algorithm that's going to figure out for each column chunk what's the best encoding scheme by looking at a sample of the data, and we'll talk about how they, how they do that, generate that sample, and then, then they apply that encoding scheme, which may produce more columns, and as long as they're of a fundamental type, you then go back and run the same algorithm to figure out what's the best encoding scheme for those derivative columns that, that came out of it. And so you're still going to be able to do the, um, you basically get almost all the benefit of something like Snappy and Z standard, but you can, you can still natively operate and decode the, the columns without having to decode, decompress everything, right? And so that means they're purposely going to not use Snappy or Z standard for, for this. Same thing with fast lanes. They're not, they're not even going to touch that stuff because it's, it's too slow and hides everything with the data system. Now, interestingly, interestingly Better Blocks makes the argument that they don't want to store the, the metadata, the schema and information about what's in the file, in the file itself, and they said that's better left to some, you know, some management service. Um, but that breaks the portability capabilities we talked about before, where you can just give someone a parquet file and there's everything you need to, to, to decipher what's inside of it is in the file itself. Um, I, I would chalk this up to more of a philosophical design decision argument rather than like, oh my gosh, like they're wrong or they're right. Some cases make sense, some cases it doesn't, yes. Is, so his, his statement is, uh, if the, sorry, you're saying if it's, if it's embedded that you're safer or you're not? I'm saying if there's any corruptions or. Corruption, I mean, yeah, so the metadata gets corrupted. Um, if the file's corrupted and the metadata's in there, then you can't really do much. Uh, right, but, but, so yeah, so his argument is like, okay, if the, if the file gets corrupted in some way and it trashes the metadata, because it's stored in the file, you can't do anything. But the, the flip side would be, if you're storing now your metadata as separate files in some other service or, you know, within, it's just, you're, you're, uh, there's more moving parts that could cause problems, right? Furthermore, again, we said we're storing in an object store. Amazon's replicating all that stuff, like, you know, I think three or four times or six times, right? Like, like so the, the likelihood, in, in all honesty, like the file is going to get truly corrupted and I, and I have no, uh, and I, and I can't recover it. If it's mission critical, then I have, I have off-site backups. I'm, like, I'm doing, you know, if, it's, if my company fails, my, my business fails because this, like, one file gets corrupted, then, like, that's my fault for not, like, making sure that, like, you know, it's written in stone, you know what I mean? So I, I think that would be the argument there. Yes? Yes, so, so she's correct. The, 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 thing we, the big thing we talked about last class was in ORC, they had a bunch of different encoding schemes, and as you ran 
you're, uh, you know, as, as you're trying to decode things, it's trying to figure out, like, on the fly, which decoding scheme should I use? Isn't, that, isn't this going to start the same problem? My understanding is, though, within the column chunk, they're picking one encoding scheme, whereas Oracle is trying to be clever on, on smaller runs. And I will say they only compare against Parquet in this paper. They don't compare against Orc. Um, and then we, we didn't, uh, for our experiments in our paper, we didn't, we didn't compare against this. But it'd be, that's an open question. Yes? So his, com so his comment is, um, the, the argument that they're making in this paper about why they want to store the metadata as a separate file is that it allows them to retrieve the file, which is going to be much smaller than the actual data, and then look at the zone maps and other information and figure out whether you even need, need to look at the file. But as we said last time, like with S3, I can go get a range. So whether, the whether getting that metadata is the footer of the file or like the, a separate file, from my perspective, it's the same. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so let's look at all the encoding schemes that they have. A bunch of these we've already seen. Uh, two of these we'll, we'll cover in more detail. So we already know about run length encoding. One value is like the extreme example, or like literally your column of sixty-four thousand uh, tuples has one value, right? So you just store that once. Uh, again, it's like it's the extreme case of RLE. Frequency encoding we didn't talk about, but this comes from IBM's DB2 Blue system from a few years ago. Basically, it's like you store the, you look at your column, you figure out what's the most common value, like what's the one value that appears most often, store that separately, uh, and then you have a bitmap to say how many times, it, where, where it occurs in the column, and then all the other values that are not, uh, not that top value, you just store them in, un, in an uncompressed, uh, in an uncompressed way. But then you feed that back into the encoding scheme to compress it further. Right, so think of like, uh, What's, what's a good example of this? Um, uh, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're at a, um, you had, you had a everybody loves for like one person. So you just store, everyone loves goes yes, store that, they have a bitmap where that occurs, and then for the few people that don't like you just store that separately, right? It's a stupid example, but that's the basic idea. Uh, frame of reference with bit packing, we, we talked about last time. Again, it's like delta encoding. They're not going to do a delta encoding. This is their variant of it, where you just store what's the, the, the min value of within a column chunk, and then just store the delta from everyone, the, everyone's delta to that, 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 uh, that global value. Dictionary encoding covered. Pseudo decimals, we didn't really talk about fixed point decimals, uh, but the basic idea is that they're going to convert um, floating point numbers into to integers by just figuring out where the decimal point is and store the integer version of that and then what power of 10 you need to convert it back to a, a decimal, right? Um, I'll briefly talk about uh, these in a second, but this is basically uh, FSST comes from the Germans and the DuckDB people. It allows you to do uh, compression on strings, but it, instead of doing dictionary encoding where you have a code represents the entire value of that string, you can do separate codes for individual bytes. I right, think if you have a, a, a column of um, a bunch of uh, uh, URLs and all the URLs start with HTTPS, so I could store the, a separate code just for HTTPS and then additional codes for the other parts of the URLs. Right? We'll talk about in a second. And then roaring bitmaps uh, is a way to do basic compressed bitmaps, but they're going to use these for nulls and exceptions, like, like the, um, the frequency encoding. If I'm keeping track of like, uh, when, you know, what, what locations is the most frequent value occurs, I would store that as a roaring bitmap. And again, we'll cover that in a second. So again, no delta encoding because it's not SIMD friendly, but then again, the fast lanes people will fix this. So the selection algorithm works like this. So basically that you're going to collect some sample data from your column. And recall, in case of ORC, ORC was using this run ahead buffer to look at the next 512 bytes to figure out, okay, or sorry, 512 values and look out, figure out what, what's, what's the next encoding scheme I should use. What they're gonna do is assuming you have the entire column chunk ahead of time, and you're gonna sample from that uniformly, and then use that to determine what's the best encoding scheme for, for this given column chunk, right? But you just can't do random sampling by just jumping in different locations because that'll make run length encoding look, look terrible, 
right? Because you're, you're going to miss that, that continuity or repeated values uh, in, in a sequence. Likewise, if you just then grab the first you know, 100 values, then it's going to make other schemes look bad because, again, you may just hit a bunch of repeated values in the beginning and therefore run length encoding looks great, but that's actually not the most optimal scheme. So what they're basically going to do is they're going to do, uh, they're going to jump to 10 different locations in a column chunk, which is 64,000 uh, values. Um, so, so basically 1%. And then when they jump to that location, they're going to then grab 64 values. So that gives you sort of the, 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 the spatial randomness within the, the column chunk itself, but also the continuity of contiguousness that you need to figure out whether RLE makes sense. So then you run the algorithm, figure out what the best encoding scheme is, uh, and then, as I said, sometimes the encoding schemes produce more outputs, and then you can just feed those outputs back into the, the next encoding scheme. Yes? Is there something really special about the greeting algorithm? Is, is there something special about the greeting algorithm as opposed to what? As in, are they trying certain suppression? Uh, they're trying all of them. Oh, they're literally trying all of them? Yeah, so, like, so say my original data is this integer of, or this, this vector of strings, so this column of strings. So this is the algorithm, right? It's an integer. So they're literally going to try all of them on the, on the sample. And they say roughly it's, it's, the, it's about 2% overhead of the compression cost. But presumably this is all done with the load the data into the database. So it's like expensive to encode at the start if they're to remove the overhead of decoding. Right. So, so his, his comment is, his basic question is when are we doing this? It's when we're loading the data into the database, right? And so the encoding is, is an expensive cost because that, but we're, we're willing to pay that cost up front once because that's going to make the, the common case of running queries run faster. Absolutely, yes. So they're saying the running this algorithm is a 2% overhead. And I think that's a fair trade off. Right? All right, so in this example here, again, they can, can just be raw, uncompressed, run this encoding. There's open source implementations to do um, uh, vectorized uh, uh, partial uh, frame of reference. Then uh, bit packing, one value we talked about, and then dictionary. So let's say this this my stupid stupid example here. Uh, it picks that run length encoding is the fastest. Well, then again, this is going to produce out two columns now, one for the the actual values, and then the the next the next column is, is the actual lengths, right? And again, they'll they'll recursively try three times for every single output. As long as it's, is it something that can be compressed again, they'll they'll feed it back into the algorithm and try it again. Right, up, up to three tries. In the case of like, you know, if you land with like bit packing, there's nothing that you can do after that. Right? So the, the algorithm terminates. So my example here is for, for integers, but then they have basically decision trees for, uh, for strings and, and doubles. And that's, okay, those are the core data types that we care about in databases. Like, yes? No, him, yes. His question is, like, do I ever, do I ever backtrack and say, oh, like, after recursively applying it, it turns out that uh, what I'm doing is, is the optimal choice is actually another path down. No. Not even if, like, the sample is not representative at all. But how do you know it's not representative? Like, once you actually start, like, encoding. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so like, yeah, a statement is basically, if I start encoding and I realize this kind of sucks, this is not the work, way it's working. It's not working out as well as I thought it was going to. Do they ever go back and, and, and try it again? I don't think they do, but I don't know. That's the same. OK. Yeah, I guess it's like also like, the, uh, what, why, what is the cost savings of like only looking at like 10% of the data? One they're looking at 1%. Oh, no. So, oh, what, never mind. I'm yep. going to say like 1% of the data versus like looking at the whole data set, trying all of them, exhaustive, exhaustive search, search space. Uh, wait, ac across the entire data set? Yeah. I mean, like, I guess it's exponential to like, but it's the same way that like 1% anyways, right? So it's like 100 times slower. Wait, I, I, I want to bulk load one, one terabyte of data. You want to? Maybe not like one terabyte. I think. No, say one terabyte. <laughs> <laughs> think no extremes. One petabyte, right? Like, <laughs> all right. So, so, yeah, that's not feasible, right? Um, and also, too, someone's got to pay for the, the, the compute, right? Uh, so, I'm. You know, again, it's it's a it's a trade off. I, I'm going to pay this computation overhead. It, Two percent seems reasonable to me, uh, in order to make queries run faster. And so, if you do the, his example or your example, like just try everything or backtrack, am I going to get another? You know, what, what is going to be that that percentage improvement? Probably not worth it. 
Yes. Yes. So, so the, the, the statement is, uh, when he ran the code locally, because uh, the source that like if they try encoding scheme and then they start encoding it, like, like, um, like how far into it will they go, like before this? Yeah. No, but but so so to your, you be saying basically that you set set the recursive def, the 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 default is three, but then it's it's it, it's the based on the sample, right? Not like he's saying if you scan the data and realize you got it wrong, like the sample said one thing, the real data looks something different. Do you then roll it back? They don't do that. You're basically saying on the sample itself they can roll back, which is fine. But on, on the sample or the, or the real data? The real data. Oh, okay. They, they, they'll roll back the whole thing? Oh, okay. Um, again, their, their, their column size is 64,000 64, values. So it's not that big. You can do everything in, in, in RAM. Okay. All right, so going back, these are all the encoding schemes that we, that we had. Uh, I want to briefly talk about FSST because uh, we'll see this uh, when we talk about DuckDB, and we'll see this in um, when we talk about how to, like, you know, pass the pass intermediate results from you know one operator to the next. This will come up, and then we're on bitmaps. This is just a better way to, to do bitmaps. Um, all right. So FSST again came, comes from this 2020 paper. It's the it's the fast lanes guy Peter Bonds. It's Victor Lice from from but Better Blocks, and then Thomas Neumann, who's probably the best database researcher in the world. Uh, we'll read a lot of his papers. Uh, those three got together and decided, let's go build a, uh, a, you know, a compression scheme for strings that allow for uh, fast random access. And again, think of like dictionary encoding. You're taking the entire string and, and, and representing it with a single code, but now you can't actually do partial lookups on that, that code to find, you know, find prefixes and other things because you, you have to go look at the entire string itself. So the idea here is that they're going to replace frequently occurring substrings up to eight bytes with one byte codes. Um, and so all the values, once they're encoded in these, these, these um, in the FSST symbols, they're all going to still be the same length. And so you have to do, uh, you know, you have to do some tricks to figure out, like, to record, like, this is the end of the string, therefore don't look at any more, more, uh, more symbols. So the way they're going to generate the symbol table is actually kind of interesting, right? Because it's, it's sort of an NP-complete problem to figure out what's the optimal uh, the optimal set of symbols that will, will produce the smallest number of codes and the, and the most compression uh, benefits. Um, so rather than try to do, like they, they mentioned, instead of doing dynamic programming or something more fancy, they just use what they call an evolutionary algorithm that anytime you think you have a good symbol as you're constructing the symbol table, they'll, just, they'll put it in this hash table. If an entry's already there, they, 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 they kick it out. Right, so it's not like the... Um, the, the linear scan or linear probing hash tables that we talked about before, or the, the chain hash table where you, you can, if someone's in your slot, you keep going until you find a, a free position, they immediately kick out whatever's there. And the idea is that as you're constructing the symbol table, if the things that actually really matter a lot, that the symbols that could provide a lot of benefit, if they keep getting kicked out, but then they're still used again, then they'll get added back. And then over time, you end up sort of roughly with a, a, a reasonably set, good set of symbols. Yes? Is the output fixed length uh, for the, the, yes, the byte codes have to be, sorry, the codes are one byte. But the substring could be variable length up to eight bytes, which is fine, because again, we, the columns would be fixed length, right? So we know exactly the number, you know. And so the question is like, if, what if you have a, um, you know, what if you have a symbol like HTTPS, and so you have a bunch of URLs that use that same code, but then someone's got, somebody's got a weird URL that's just, it's just HTTPS, then you need to, Keep track that this thing is only. You need a way to to to, to denote that that the string is actually terminated. So don't interpret any any other bytes remaining in my, my fixed length portion of the value. Because otherwise you, you could go look up and add start adding more symbols that, that that aren't actually in the original string. So again, this is just a better way to do. Or it's actually the. This is basically what Z standard is, or, or LZ4, or Snappy. 
they're basically doing the same thing inside of their, you know, in their compression scheme. But again, it's opaque to the database system. This is now an explicit scheme where we can expose the symbol table to the database system, and we know exactly what the, the, how to match the codes to, to, to strings. And so you can do all the same tricks. You can do dictionary encoding to find prefixes and other stuff by just looking at the symbol table without actually looking at the real values for some, some types of queries. Yes? Is it recursive in that like, if you have like, a byte that you get out of the symbol table, then like, it, will, it can also be code like a substring? Like, if you have a substring of like, 16 bytes, it can scrape up. Yeah, so the question is, is, is it possible to have uh, a code refer to another code? Like, yeah, basically, or, or, yeah, so refer to another substring that contains another code, I guess. Oh, it's a, yeah, the question is, could you have a situation where the inside the symbol table is another code, so don't interpret all of the, the, the bytes in the, in the original string as, as the string itself. Interpret some of them as actually another code that I do have a cursor lookup. But then how do you record that you should go, that portion of the string, you know, should be another lookup? I was asking if that's like a thing that they do or not. So a lot of the design decisions they made for this is, is like, this example of like, okay, you don't do the linear probing to find a free slot. You immediately kick out whatever, whatever's in there. They did this because you now you can do this all in, in SIMD. Because you can't have conditionals, you can't have uh, loops in, in SIMD, right? So by just doing everything like, okay, here's the exact instructions we're always going to do. If someone's there, kick it out, just overwrite them. Uh, then like you can, you can vectorize all of this. So in your thing, you would have to have some bit set somewhere that says, oh, by the way, at, at, at this offset for this string, don't interpret it as a varchar, don't, as an ASCII character. It's actually a code that you want to feed back into it. You wouldn't be able to do it with the SIMD. Okay, so again, I, I don't have a demonstration of what this looks like. I can post something on Slack uh, when Peter gave a talk a few, uh, a few years ago. Uh, one thing that is cool that does show up a lot in data systems now these days are called roaring bitmaps. Out of curiosity, who, who here has heard of roaring bitmaps before? Yeah, very, very few. All right. Basically, it's a way to, uh, to store a bitmap index in a, um, with different data structures based on the, 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 how often bits are being set to true within some portion of, of the range that we're trying to record, right? So again, a bitmap index can tell you something that just at some position is a bit set, set yes or no, right? So you can use this like a, like a bloom filter, like for set membership and so forth, right? So the, the dense chunks were to store these as uh, uncompressed bitmaps, because um, there really isn't any way to make that better, right? It's literally just, just the bits. Um, well, you can then turn back and, and recompress it again with nested encoding with RLE. Um, we'll, we'll ignore that for now. And then the sparse chunks, we'll just store them as bit-packed arrays of 16-bit integers, right? So there's a lot of different implementations of this. And pick your favorite programming language. There's a lot of different data systems out there that, are, that are use this. Uh, Pelosa is the open source version of a system called FeatureBase. And feature base basically stores almost everything as, as a lot of data as roaring bitmaps um, using in the byte slicing techniques we'll see in a second. But all right, here's the basic idea. So say again, we, we're going we're gonna to split up the, the range of values that we're going to support. Into, in this case here, I have four chunks, right? So for every single key I, I want to set to true or look up to see whether it's set to true, I'm just going to divide it by uh, 2 to the 16, and that basically tells me what, which path I want to go down. And then within the container, within that range, I'll just, you know, I can set something to true based on how it's actually being stored, right? So then what happens is in the default setting, if the number of values that have been set to true within that range is less than 4096, then you just store it as an uncompressed array. Um, otherwise, then store it as a bitmap, right? So say I want to do set to key equals 1,000, right? I'm going to divide it by 2 to the 16. I land in this partition here. And then now I keep track of the number of bits that are set to true in this container. At this point, it's zero. So I'll just store, the, you know, store it as a bit packed or a 16-bit integer right, with original value. Um, now say I want to store this key here. Uh, do the same thing, divide by 2 to the 16. I land in partition 3. But now I see that this is being stored as, uh, as a bitmap. So I just do the math and say, OK, at what offset uh, w within that range should I, should I set my bit to true, right? So in this case here, just doing the math like this, you get position 50. So you just go jump in here and set bit to 50, right? That's it. So as, as you, as you uh, delete and insert things, it, it'll adjust back and forth between what data structure you want to use. Yes? What's the benefit of having it stored in an array? Like, what is the overhead of just, just doing everything in 
the question is, what's the overhead of storing everything as a bitmap? Uh, so in this example here, what, I have 2 to the 16 different values. So I need a bit, and you need to store 2 to the 16 bits that I can set to true. Shouldn't you just like dynamically edit without doing like That's expensive, right? Uh, it's great. So David is, I did, can I just, if I say I have 2 to the 16 and I, and I now I go beyond that, I'll just remalloc? Uh, you could do that, sure, but then it's, um, well, you could do that, but for some values, it, it, like, if it, you're treating everyone the same, and so it, it may be the case that your data structure is, sorry, the, 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 the domain range is wide, but within that, it's sparse, right? So now I'm, I'm jumping to different cache lines or different, different chunks of memory just to go see whether things are set to true, whereas if it's a bit pack array, which I can, I can then compress it again, uh, this, this is better. Yes? Is this an idea from the Germans? Or? Uh, no, this is from a, a French Canadian guy, Daniel Lemire. And it's used in? A lot of systems use this, right? For bitmaps, right? Um, I get a bit, it's, it's a, um, it's actually, it, it takes inspiration from, um, a paper from the Germans called ART, which I'm not going to cover. It's basically adaptive radix try, where they, they can keep track of the, the population within some, some path down in the try, and, or, and they'll, they'll change the, the, the size of the, of, the, of the node. It's sort of the same idea. Yes? Has someone tried to repeat this exact thing for a level down as well? So you have some partitioning at the top, and then partitioning it again? This question is, has anybody tried to do a hierarchical chunking? Yes, there is hierarchical bitmaps. Uh, you get screwed on, on superscalar CPUs. It's just too much indirection. I, I, I have a slide for that, but not, we're not covering that this semester. That's like an idea from like the 90s. No one does it anymore. In that case, also, too, what you're proposing, why bother doing that extra level? Right? Just make, make the top level larger. Yes? How do you interpret the bits instead of partitions? Say it again? How do you interpret the bits instead of partitions? question, oh, how do I interpret the bits? It's a bitmap index, right? So, so you would say, so you want to say, is is fifty set to, is this key set to, set to true? So after doing the division to figure out, I'm going down this path. I know that whatever the position is, what bit position in this is, the offset to get the original key is uh, is is this value plus the offset to reverse it back, not the key, but the actual that, that the, the starting point of the range, right? So now, within this, again, so say, I forget, I forget how many things I have in here, but if I want to know, is position 50 set to true, uh, like, sorry, at position 50, I know that corresponds to my key here. I can then check whether that bit's set to true or not. Which one's set to true? In this? I mean, I, it's just PowerPoint. I don't, I don't know. I, yeah, but that's, it's, it's a bitmap index. I think we covered it in, in the intro class, uh, where basically, again, if I want to know if is the value at tuple 5 a, a given, you know, set to something, we're ignoring how, what, how this actually gets mapped to something, I can then look to see whether a bit that corresponds to position five is set to true. And then some higher level part of the system then interprets what, what does that mean. Is this like a rudimentary version of a Bloom filter then? This question, is this a rudimentary, rudimentary version of a Bloom filter? Uh, Bloom filter might set more than one bit. And but so a Bloom filter is a probabilistic data structure where you can get false positives. This, you don't get false positives. You want to know something's in there, this will tell you yes or no. Could, could you have more than one data value that maps to the same index? This question is, can you have uh, more than one value mapped to the same index? Uh, no, right? Because again, we're dividing it by 2 to the 16 to figure out what partition we go to, and then we take the mod, which is basically the remainder of that, to figure out what bit within that. So you won't have any overlap. What if the value comes again, like if you have the same key again? This question is, what if it's the same key again? What again, what is that, what are you trying to do with it? Again, so think of like, if I'm, if I'm storing the, the null bitmap, right? I can store it as this, and then I don't, you know, I'm not gonna set the, you know, the tuple, tuple at offset 50 null multiple times, it doesn't make sense, right? It's not trying to do, it's not accounting data structure, it's just a set membership. Okay. All right, so, um, but better blocks, parquet, and orc generate variable length runs of values. 
Um, parquet, but better blocks is less susceptible to this, um, but you could still have that within, you know, ac across the, the, the column chunks. Um, and then better blocks explicitly uh, uh, avoided delta encoding, because again, you have this problem where the, the value of one given tuple would depend on the preceding value. And again, you can't use SIMD for that. Um, so the, in the case of better blocks, they're always going to use run length encoding the vectors. Um, even if the, if the data is the, which you end up encoding is smaller than the number of lanes you have in the SIMD register. And so think of like if I, if I can, I, in my SIMD registers, I can put 16 values, but I only have, uh, only have 12 values. They're still going to use all 16 positions in the SIMD register, uh, and then the, the last four are just garbage, and they'll clean that up afterwards. Um, and in the case of fast lanes, we'll see in a second, they align things such a way that you're always guaranteed to always be doing useful work in your, in your SIMD registers. So fast lanes is not a complete file format in the same way that, that better blocks is. It's just a, you know, a low level encoding scheme that is going to achieve better par data parallelism through reordering the tuples in such a way that again, you're always guaranteeing or always maximizing the amount of useful work you're doing in your, in your, in your SIMD, SIMD registers or SIMD instructions. So the, they're going to have all the same encoding schemes as better blocks, but again, with the addition of, of delta encoding. And what's really wild about this paper is that, as I said, they were, rather than designing it for one you know, instance or, or configuration of, of SIMD for one CPU vendor, they basically say, hey, we're going to make our own virtual ISA, and that's going to have 10 to 1024 SIMD registers. Again, even though that hardware does not exist, or they allude to... Like I think M1 has 1024-bit uh, cache lines and so forth, right? Um, it's a way to the, you know, portending or, or seeing, foreseeing the, or foreshadowing the arrival of 1024-SIMD registers. I remember seeing some talk from somebody at Intel saying, why well, this is not happening anytime soon, but that was a few years ago. Maybe things have changed. But, but again, the idea is that they're going to define all their operations on basic, basic constructs on these, uh, this virtual ISA, and then they can show how you can then map that to either scalar SysD code, which apparently still runs really well, or a, an existing SIMD instruction set. So the key, key coder thing that they're doing is with this uniform transpose layout. And again, the idea is that you're going to reorder the, the values in a column, the tuples in a column, in such a way that you can do as, as much work as you can entirely on SIMD. And the reason why we can get away with this, as I said before, is because we have this independence between the physical layer and the logical layer. The relational model uh, is based on unordered sets. So you, as, you, as the, the application program, when you put data into a database, you should not expect that the data will be inserted in the same way that you, or the, the data will come back to you in your queries in the same way that you inserted it, right? Most of the times, you'll actually, for some cases, you'll, you know, depending on the system, you'll usually get that. But again, in the case of Postgres, as soon as you run the auto vacuum, that's going to start moving tuples around, and there's no guarantee that you'll end up with the same, the same ordering. Right? If you cared about ordering, you would explicitly have an order by, order by clause. Because right? also, if you think about it too, like what's the optimal ordering for a, uh, you know, for a, a set of column, for one given column versus another, that could depend based on what the, what the query actually wants to do. So instead, they're going to make the choices, we'll, we'll store this in the best way for us to process the data, and then let the query engine above it figure out how to do the, stitch things back together. If you wanted to record the order that things were inserted, you could add a selection vector that basically keeps track of the position of tuples when they arrived, but the overhead of that sort of negates any of the benefits you're getting. So again, all the algorithms they're going to define are going to be based on this, this virtual ISA, and then they just either emulate it on AVX512 or scalar instructions. So in the second time, I'm just going to show one example of of how this works using uh, a column that will convert into uh, run length encoding, and then we'll convert that into dictionary encoding with, with deltas. And we'll see how to do everything in, in, a, in a vectorized way with the, with the reordering. All right, so say there's our original column, we have a bunch of string characters here. And so we can just first we'll convert this to run length encoding. So we have our original dictionary values here, C, B, C, A, um, or B, C, B, C, B, A. And then for each of those, you, have, you specify the run length as separate integers. And the numbers on the bottom are just telling you the positions within the vector where, where, they, where they correspond to. So for this one now, we can do delta encoding. Right? So we would have the starting base value here is 0. And then you can sort of read this as going across. 
that we're just adding, uh, taking the delta, whatever the, the preceding value for us was. And then the index vector then tells you how to take uh, this, to think of this as materialization after you've done the reverse the delta encoding to then tell you what are the, what are the actual symbols uh, that, that, that you want to get back, right? So th th they'll set things up like this, but then they go ahead and take this delta encoded vector because the index vector you, you, don't, you don't actually use. You just materialize it. Sorry, you just materialize it and then do the delta encoding on it. They then order things in such a way that the, the contiguous values aren't going to be one after, sorry, within the original data set aren't going to be one after another. They're going to be, in this example here, you know, four elements away. So now when you, when you want to decode this, this vector like this, the, because it's delta encoding, we have the base vector is going to be now four elements instead of uh, just, just one as before. So as I start off, I, t I take the, these four elements. I do the SIMD addition now to apply it to the, this vector here. And then I produce the output here. And they're doing some extra steps to make sure that things are written out to the output in memory at these different locations because these correspond to the positions that they exist in the original index vector. Right? Because if I, if I just have them be, you know, this is right next to this, right next to that, then that's going to screw up all my ordering that I need for you know, the offsets to jump to other columns. So, these, these, so even though things are coming out incrementally um, in, out of order, we, we want to space things out so that it goes back into the right order. And they talk about the, the bit shifting and other operations they do in SIMD to make this, make this work. Again, so now we slide over the window to look at the next operations. And then in this case here, we're taking the output of, that was generated from this, or these values here, and then now we can do SIMD to apply it to this next one to produce the, the next set of outputs. And likewise, we do this going down the line like that. Yes? So on disk, we store the top right block, right? This question is, uh, we store this top, like the, the yellow one. The only the yellow one, or the whole, you have to store the whole thing? You store, you store the whole thing, and then the yellow. And the, and the yellow. Yes. So the statement is, um, isn't this much worse than run like encoding because the size is smaller? Yes, yes but the compression, is, the compression is faster. They, so the, the decoding, decoding is faster, yes. Again, classic computer science, compute versus storage. So I can store less data, but it's going to make more work for, for me to, uh, to, to decompress it. Again, nobody does this as far as, at least there's no open source system that stores data like this. This is wild. Um, and you know, again, the, the paper talks about other, other ways to handle this uh, for other different encoding schemes. But again, like the, the basic idea is that we're, we're sort of spraying bits out onto in these vectors so that when we go to decode them, uh, they, they line up nicely into, into our SIMD registers. And we don't have to do this scatter gather stuff to like move things around to put it in the form that we actually need. So you can't actually decode this, the run-length encoding with SIMD, right? Um, because you basically need conditional loops now to say, OK, I look at the run length here. It's 7. Let me loop through in SIMD seven times. You can cogen it and do it, right? But we'll, we'll see this in, in a week or so, that like cogening brings a whole bunch of other problems that make, make, make lives harder. Yes? The statement is, uh, can you also compress this? Yeah, uh, better blo so better blocks would? I don't, these guys don't. Because no, so if, if you do run the encoding on this, you're back to this problem. OK? All right, so I want to finish up talking about uh, bit slicing, bit weaving real quickly. So all the schemes we've talked about so far, uh, Parkade, Oric, Better Blocks, Fast Lanes, they are all about when you scan a column, you're looking at the entire value for each tuple in its entirety every single time. Uh, and that means that you can't, um, you can't short circuit the, 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 the scan or the filter if you recognize early on that this data is never going to match. 
So I mean, you, you can do this for strings if the string is decoded. Like if you ever look at like the string compare operation or in libc, it's just a for that looks at every single element. And then if it, if, it, if, if it doesn't match the thing you're looking for, then it breaks out of the loop, right? That, that's what short circuiting is. But if we're comparing two integers, right? It's a sing, ignoring SIMDs, SIMD, it's a si single instruction. You know, is this equal to this? That you're, you're let the lowest level of the hardware, you're looking at these primitive data types. You can't, if you, you, know, you can't do any tricks to say, oh, I recognize that the first bit of these two values aren't going to match. So why compare the other 31 bits, right? Because that's, that's, the, that's the, uh, the interface that the, the hardware provides you, the API the hardware provides you. So, but we're data people, we can do whatever we want, right? So what if we could do this? So like how, how, you know, is, there such a, is there a way to be able to recognize that we can just look at a subset of a value and do comparisons based on that and only look at the rest of the data for, for that value if we think it's, it's going to be meaningful or still match, if we, if we need to. So this is, the basic idea is called bit slicing. And this is an old idea from, uh, from the 1990s. There was a system called Sybase, or I guess it's still around, Sybase IQ that does this. Um, the the Pelosa, or feature-based system I mentioned, does this now. The basic idea is that we're going to store, instead of storing the actual just integers, all the bits contiguously, it's like an extreme case of the column store. So the column store was taking the rows, or a row and breaking up into columns, storing all the columns contiguously. Now with bit slicing, we're going to take the bits within a value uh, uh, in a column and store those things contiguously. So the first bit for every single value in, 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 uh, for all tuples, store that contiguously, and then so forth the other bits. So let's see an example here. So there's all the places I lived in my life. Uh, I grew up in, in, in Maryland, 21042. Uh, you know, it's Compton, there's Pittsburgh, I lived in Wisconsin, a bunch of places. So we're going to take, say, 21042, convert it to its binary form, and then now we're going to store a, uh, again, a separate column of bits for every single one of those, uh, every single one of these positions. Now these are 32-bit integers. I'm showing 17 bits because it has to fit on PowerPoint, but whatever. Um, right? So then we always have a null bitmap, but then we just can scan along, look at all the bits, and now store them across uh, in separate vectors. And we'll do the same thing for all, all the other ones, like this. Again, think of these as, again, these are just contiguous uh, bitmaps. And again, I can use Roaring bitmaps now to represent this. Right. In some cases, make the, 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 the least significant bits. Maybe those are not, uh, those, are, those are sparse, but the most significant bits are dense. Right? So now I want, I want to do lookups, uh, queries. Select star from a customer table where zip code is less than uh, uh, 15, uh, 15217. I can now walk across each slice and construct a result bitmap to see what tuples, the different offsets, at, at the bit level are matching my, my predicate. And then I can determine if I don't see any more matches as I'm going along, I stop. Right? So this is the bit, re bit, bit representation for 15217. So say some simplicity. Maybe I just look at the first three bits because these are all zeros. So that means that if there's any tuple that has a bit set in these first three uh, vectors, then I know it can't match my, my tuple because it's going to be greater than 15217. So I know I don't need to, to look at that, that, that position anymore, right? That's the basic idea of bit slicing. The original algorithm was all scale instructions. We'll see bit weaving in a second that can do, do this in, in SIMD. But bit slicing, can do, you can do some other interesting things. Like some, some, some queries, like aggregate queries, there's actually really simple operations to compute these things quickly. So if you want to compute the, the sum of, of integers, well, I could use the Hamming weight or the Hamming count uh, for just counting the number of bits that are set to one in, in a column. And the, you know, Intel and, and SIMD, sorry, Intel provides instructions to do this very, very quickly using pop count, right? So there's one instruction to go compute the number of bits that are set within some, you know, some vector. So now I just count all the, the bits in the first slice and, mul and then multiply that by 2 to the 17, go to the next slice, count all the bits, multiply that by 2 to the 16, and two to the, go all the way down, and then I end up with the aggregation for, uh, for all my, um, for, you know, for all my columns, <coughs> or for, for, for my column here. And again, that's way faster than just you know doing integer instructions to, to add and, you know, add the sum together. So bit slicing, like I said, there was original ideas from the 1990s. Jignesh 
uh, was exploring this topic in the, in the previous decade, and I think he's looking at it again now, of uh, this technique called bit weaving. And the idea here is that it's an alternative coding scheme for column databases that's being predicated on this idea of bit slicing, but you're going to do it in such a way that will, uh, you can maximize the amount of SIMD prospects or opportunities that you actually have. And what's wild is that he did this work in 2013 when SIMD was the for AVX2 uh, didn't have all the scatter gather features or the AVX512 stuff we'll see uh, in, a, in, a, in two weeks, right? And so the, the horizontal bit weaving approach we'll see is, is entirely scalar, but then for the, the vertical one, it's basically it's the same thing as bit slicing, but it shows you how you can use SIMD for this even though back in the day they didn't have all the Cindy capabilities that we have now. So Jignesh was building this in a project called QuickStep. Think of this as like DuckDB for DuckDB, like it was an embedded OLAP engine, but like it didn't have a SQL front end. It was just like a, like a storage manager that can run OLAP queries and store things as, as, as columnar data. So think of like almost RocksDB, but for OLAP queries. Um, and so he spun it off as, a, as a, an Apache project, but then I think it died in 2018. The code is still there. I think. He's still working on it, roughly, I think, right? Somebody's working on it. But I don't think the bit weaving stuff is actually in any of this. But the, the academic, the open source version did not have it. The academic version did. But as far as I know, no other system implements this. All right, so the two ways, the two different coding schemes that they propose, the horizontal one is basically a row storage at the bit level, and the vertical one is going to be like bit slicing, but you'll do this in such a way for, uh, that you can be clever about how to get better parallelism through vectorization. So I'm going to kind of rush through this, but I just want to give you the flavor of what's going on. So with horizontal storage, the idea is that here's all our tuples we want to store, and here's the, the bit representation of the values, and the red is their values. So we're going to break this up into segments. Uh, again, think of this as like a row group within, within our, um, you know, in, 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 in our, in our, in our data file. And then within a segment, we're going to store the data in, in order going from the top to the bottom. So this is, in the first vector, we'll have t0. Second vector, the, the, the starting point is t1, 2, 3, and then wrap around in, in 4. And then we have the same thing for the, uh, the other segment, but because we don't have additional entries, we don't need to store other, other vectors. Right? And so in my demonstration here, I'm showing the, these are 8-bit vectors, but this would be like a processor word, um, which I think for x86 is 16 bits, because uh, it's from the 80s, but ARM is 32 bits. Basically, this is the, um, the, the, the sort of large representation that the processor can operate on. All right, so then you now, in addition to uh, storing the values as three bits, there's going to be this padding value here that we're going to use as a, a place to record for a given operation, was it true or false, right? So, so for, when you store things in this bit weaving approach, you always have to have this extra space. Uh, so you're paying a one bit penalty per per tuple to store it in, in, this, in this manner. But that's going to allow us to do SIMD operations or do operations where we just store what happened to our, you know, whether, again, the, the filter or whatever we're trying to do, if it applies to true, we'll store it here rather than some other location in memory. So let's see, see an example here. We have a query we want to find in our table, find all the values less than five. So say we'll just start with the, 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 the first vector. So that's going to have T0 and T4. And then we have now uh, our, our encoding for the value 5 is this 101. So we'll, we'll have repeated versions of that, or repeated values for instances of those bits corresponding to all the, the, the lanes up above for the, the tuples we're trying to compare against. And then there's some mass vector where the, they define formulas that specify how to actually do this arithmetic just using bit operations, bit level operations. Um, so to, I guess to do addition, so whatever this formula is here, so it says all ones. So then now I can just do, and this, this, I, I do the operation, produces the selection vector that determines whether um, the, the, the predicate evaluated true if, if the padding bit is set to 0, 1. So in this case here, T0 is what? Is 1, so that's less than 5, that's set to true. And then T4 was, uh, what is that, 7, so that's set to uh, that, that's, that is less, that is greater than five, so that's set to zero, right? Or six, sorry. Um, but yeah. So what's, what's nice about this is that it only requires three instructions to evaluate a single word. So I, I can compare two values within a single instruction, whereas if I'm just running this 
in columnar data, ignoring compression and all that other stuff, and coding schemes, I would basically say, OK, is, is 1 less than 5 true or false? Is 5 less than 6 true or false? But even without you know, I can SIMD and vectorize that and make that run fast. But even without SIMD, if I, if I store the data in this bit read pattern, I can just use regular SISD instructions to get the same kind of data parallelism we would get otherwise. So now we got to, though, you know, if, we, if you apply it to all our vectors, we're going to end up with a bunch of these different um, these selection vectors, right? But now we got to put this back together to get, get back the offsets of, of, of our tuples, or sorry, in, in our column, that actually were, were set to true or satisfied our predicate. So to do this, all you need to do is just bit shifting to slide thing, everything over uh, so many steps. And then I can then collapse it with, uh, with an OR operation to, to generate the, the, the selection vector that corresponds to you know, whether the, the, the tuple match at a given offset. And then if I need to go back to the original value, I can use that to figure out, go get the original tuple. The problem is with the selection vector is that it's just bits. right? We need a way to reverse that and say, is, you know, at, at what position is the bit set to true? To know, again, what offset in our, in our, in our original vector matches the true. So the easiest thing to do is just iterate like a simple for loop. right? If the, if the selection vector is set to true, then add it to an output buffer. But that sucks, right? That's, that's a for loop. That's slow. Again, just to convert bit offsets into to values. As far as I know, there isn't a SIMD instruction. There isn't a you know, CPU instruction to do this for us. So the alternative is to use a, tra a trick called, came from the Vectorwise paper uh, from Peter Bontz and the paper you guys read next Monday, um, where you pre-compute all the positions. Uh, so you pre-compute all the selection vectors ahead of time. And then now you just have a simple array that says, OK, well, if I, just, if I take this binary encoding and convert it to the actual number, in this case it's 150, I jump to my array at offset 150, and then now I'm storing my, my, my selection vector to tell you what positions are set to true. And again, in my simple example here, the, the size selection vector is, is 8 bits. So with 2 to the 8 possible values, like this thing is easily sitting in L, L2 cache. So it's, it's not, not, it's not you know, this big chunk of memory I've I, I got to maintain just to convert bit, you know, bit, bit maps into values. All right, last one, uh, bit, weaving, uh, bit weaving vertical. So for this one, we're going to store the bits that are all within you know, some offset contiguously. Right? So we're going to have one vector for all the bits at position 0, a next vector for position, position 1, 2, and so forth. Right? And then now we get down to this other segment here, because it only has two values, we still have to put, we still have to record the entire vector, but we just have a bunch of zeros in there. So it's wasted space. It's going to waste instructions the way that the, the fast lane guys don't like, but it makes, it makes our life easier when we want to do the calculations. Right? So this is vector here, and so forth. And again, same thing as it's a processor word. But now we don't have this padding bit anymore right, to, to be able to record things. We can do everything, we do everything here in SIMD. So I want to do a lookup and say, find me all the tuples where value equals 2. Again, 2 is just that bitmap like that. I take the first vector. Uh, I generate a mask vector that I'm, that's, that I'm going to use for my comparison. And because this is 0, these are all zeros, I want to see whether these are set to true uh, across this. And I get my selection vector like this. And then now I run pop count and say, are there, is there at least one bit set to 1? If yes, then I keep going. If, it, if there's no bit set to 0, then I, I short circuit. I terminate without having to look at, look at the other vectors. So I only need to look at the subset of the data within a given, given value at the bit level. In this case here, there's some bit set to 1. So I go down to the next vector. Now I do comparison with my, my mask that says, find me all the, the values that are equal to 1 at different positions. Now my selection vector is all zeros. So I know there's nothing else that could ever match my predicate, and I stop. Right? So in this stupid example here, I have what three bit values. If I had 64-bit values or 32-bit values, I could stop early. And I'm comparing multiple, uh, again, within the instructions that I'm doing in SIMD, I'm looking at way more values than I would otherwise if I were looking at the entire you know, values of, of the integers. So we do all the early pruning. We did like bit slicing. Um, again, skip last, last, last vector if all the bits are, are produce zero. Um, and then the algorithm has a bunch of, uh, the paper has a bunch of algorithms to, to handle all the other operations you want to do. I kind of I rushed this, but I just want to, 
you know, we're not going to see the, this technique used in other papers, but it's, again, it's just a different way to think about how to actually store data in a database, which I like. All right, so I said this multiple times throughout today's lecture. This is really showing you that, again, the logical and physical data independence is super important. Right? He was starting to say things like, oh, what do you have pointers to, to, to data? And that, that like, as a, someone who like, adheres to the relational model, that gives me nightmares. Like, pointers to what? Why? Like, that's a bad idea. We want to be able to use just fixed length all sets and do anything we want underneath the covers and not worry about, uh, you know, be able to not worry about explicit pointers to different things uh, and not worry about how programmers actually see those pointers. Right? Everything's done underneath the covers. And that way, they can just write SQL, write whatever Python code that they want, operates on, on, our, on our system, and nothing changes. And then the data parallelism through SIMD is going to be a really important tool we'll see throughout the entire semester. All right, the, the paper on Monday next week will be the precursor to using SIMD for stuff. Uh, it was written in 2006 or 7, so SIMD wasn't as, as, as useful for databases as, as it is now. But it's designing the query processing model for the database system in such a way that you can vectorize a bunch of stuff. Okay? But we'll see algorithms how to do joins, uh, uh, filters, and other things using SIMD going forward. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can chill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I red. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. We go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the chili cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man to get a can of St. Isles.